The following podcast is scheduled for one fall. Introducing first, the ace that runs the place, Sam Tate. And his tag team partner, Rob is Warren. Welcome back to yet another scheduled for one fall podcast. I'm, of course, Sam Tate, the Ace Maneuvers. I'm joined by Roz Warren. And Warren, we are picking up on the road to WrestleMania. How hyped are you for WrestleMania, my dude? Oh, man. Excitement plateaued as fuck this week, dude. I I feel like everything's shaping up pretty much as we predicted. <laughs> Matchups are, are coming together that are, I mean okay i think the one that i'm most excited to look at right now is the slowly building one between Rey mysterio and his son but you know we have to assume that's going to get paid off with an actual matchup but overall man actually this week i'm not all that excited about the big dance there's something strange about it it tastes funny yeah i gotta say the one i'm looking the most forward to is finn balor and edge and even then i I can't imagine why I would care about this yeah. this match that's actually happened four times already. Well, I love the idea of them teasing the demon, you know, as a way of, of, of changing the presentation of these two men going at it, because you're right, they've basically been doing this dance for about a year now, but... I am excited to think about Femen, uh, Demon Finn Balor being there because at least it's a different take on that, on that well, presentation of his character. I wonder if he'll do something that's actually different and unique as the Demon, for this will be the first time we'll see that character in a heel role. So maybe there will be a different way that character goes about you know, laying on the offense to Edge or winning the match, if we're assuming he's going to do that, which you got to do that, right, Edge? You're not going to win this WrestleMania matchup with somebody <laughs> who still has life left on their career. Oh, he's, right? he's coming back. He's got to establish himself, brother. Wow. Edge has been back for two years. He won a Royal Rumble and still got stacked on top of Daniel Bryan, right? Well, that was justice, wasn't it? I'm... <laughs> I'm, I I don't know. It depends on if you want to see Edge actually succeed on this run or not. Well, so, I mean, Daniel Bryan should have won that match, but if you're going to try and make somebody, if you're going to try and legitimize the bloodline thing, you, you had to stack them and smash them. Of course you did, and you had to create this super mega star that Roman has been for two years through that moment, or with the aid of that moment. It and was extremely... nobody, nobody ever references that. Nobody ever references that match. Nobody can name one fucking spot from that match. And it, Roman's been like this this figure. You know, he hasn't been the same guy, right? He hasn't been doing the same the same shtick the whole time or anything, but. You know, Roman's been this figure that's been in the forefront and in the main event of WrestleMania's so, 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 so much that, like, that didn't actually do anything to establish the bloodline. All it did was not derail the fucking train. Mm hmm. Uh, yeah. Well, the, the train's been choo chewing its way through towards the main event of WrestleMania once again, this time with Cody Rhodes standing across from him. And. I know they've been working awfully damn hard to help us believe that Cody Rhodes is the guy. And I've heard from several major fans, big fans, folks who watch E way more religiously than you and I, they are really ready to see Cody be that guy. And I don't know what it is about this, but I'm still struggling to be on board. And I think Roman Reigns encapsulated a lot of what I'm feeling in his promo this past week, where he simply pointed out that, well, you didn't want to do the Stardust stuff, so you left, and then you failed to get over in a company you built, and so you, you came back. Like, he's right. <laughs> Is Cody can think that he's destined for this, but there's something extremely unsavory about this payoff, if that's really what they're going to go with. It'll be the first time in a while I think they've made a major misstep, and I talked about that a lot last week. Ugh. I am I'm trying to figure out what could be cool about this match. Like I'm trying to 
find it, and maybe I'm just not a fan of Cody Rhodes and Roman Reigns. Like, I'm not a fan of their types of matches, even in AEW. It always felt like Cody was just doing stuff just for the sake of doing it. He's like, you ever, <laughs> you, you grew up in the, the 2000s. You ever have that friend who's like the Xbox achievement point hunter where he'll, he'll like game fly. He'll rent a game every day for 30 days just to plug it into his Xbox and get every achievement point you can get from just fucking starting the game up and completing one level. Yes, a million percent. As a matter of fact, I'm pretty sure I'm living with one of those right now. <laughs> I thought you were going to say you were that guy, but yeah, you know, they're just like the guy who, you know, goes out of their way to get every easy possible achievement just because, you know, like the gamer score, it doesn't matter, but I mean, it's free. And like Cody is doing that. He is going out of his way get every little achievement that doesn't require i mean i guess these uh, to say it doesn't require work or whatever is not fair he's permanently scarred from taking a flaming table bump for no reason i can't remember the opponent i can't remember who who uh, who he put by the way he put someone else through that table do you remember this at all do you have any clue what i'm talking about we're talking about Cody's flaming table spot. Yeah, do you have you even heard of that? <laughs> no. Yeah, this recall. is like the perfect example, right? Like Cody did a like super back body drop to some other fucking wrestler for some fucking uh, Stefano might know. That's the real gauge. If Stefano knows, maybe it's legit. But if he can't remember the fucking spot, then I will declare it's forever for no reason. Um. But yeah, it's, he puts someone else through a flaming table, but he clearly lands like the brunt on it. And the whole match leading up to this, you can see his skin is like flaking off because he applied, um, you know, a heat resistant gel, like an anti inflammatory mm-hmm. gel, so you can still wrestle like shirtless and everything like that. So, like, the whole match is just kind of gross. He's got stuff flaking off of him. It's, you know, very clearly going to be. <laughs> the relevant later and then right. yeah he's the one who takes the majority of the punishment from his own flaming table spot and i can't tell you how what where when or why that was done you know like if you're going for an ecw vibe sure absolutely i can't name every single person that the dudleys put through a, a flaming table but i can tell you that you know, the last time I remember watching a flaming table spot in WWE, it was Edge and McFoley, and I can tell you what event it was at. You know, and I can tell you that Lita was there, and she helped light the fucking table. You know, like there's key moments there that made it worth something. It wasn't just a fucking checklist. You know, it wasn't just a check mark on Edge's bucket list. Hmm. It's true. That moment where Edge and Mick Foley did their fall through the flaming table at WrestleMania was one of those moments that really solidified Edge as a, you know, career star. And I feel like it's 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 almost ironic. And I get where you're coming from now more than ever when you say that Cody does stuff just to do stuff, you know? (laughs) He's like, wait, oh shit, I gotta cross the whole flaming table thing off my career list or no one will buy me as the top star. So Make sure he... I do it as fake as fucking possible. And there he goes. And it's just in one ear and out the other for me. And as much love as I have for Dusty Rhodes, we said it last week and, you know, it it, it cannot be the reason why this guy is ready to dethrone the greatest WWE champion we've had in 10 years, at least statistically. And it's almost grinding my teeth at this point where I watch them try different dynamic after different dynamic in, in, in an attempt to inspire us as fans to really be behind this victory and the thing is, is I recognize that so much of the fan base is ready for it and excited for it and hungry for it. And normally a different version of me, you'd think, would be all about this. But I I feel so overly reminded through what I'm watching that Cody just doesn't deserve to be that guy. And it's only because WWE fans don't pay attention to any other promotion out there that they're smelling these roses and expecting this to be the outcome. I'm 
I'm so bummed that it's probably going to happen, you know, if I'm being honest. And I almost don't want to be, like, forced to believe any longer that I want this because I just don't. I just 100% don't. Like, you, is there... No. You can blame maybe the injury. That's the thing I always fall back on is maybe there would have been some kind of really cool build to this story, but, I mean, Cody comes back. People are happy to see him back. He it pops the crowd, and then he, he gets injured, and everyone's, like, mystified because, like... He's trying to do, he's trying to show how tough of a guy he is, you know, and I get that. He's trying to do all the tough stuff and live up to some kind of legacy. But at the same time, it's he's, vanity. He's it's work- 100. At the same time, he's wrestling once a month. Oh, uh, I don't know. He's not wrestling four times a week on the road. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's, <sighs> he's. he's he wants to dip into some reservoir of of accolades, but it's just for a bygone era. Like he's not he's not his father. He's not trying to be his father, but like he's also just doing spot show bullshit. So I don't know. Well, I'm not going to be the one to come to anybody's rescue right now and cheer for Roman uh, or excuse me, Cody. I, I can't quite pull it off. I feel like there's been this fantastic opportunity for him to evolve into the wrestler or evolve. I'm trying to say evolve, um, try to evolve into the wrestler he wants to be. And he's hitting all the moves that he wants, but there's nothing really all that exciting or interesting about his character outside of his lineage. And he cut a good promo. I'm not going to lie. He cut a good promo. It was either this week or last week after a match where he was turning red in the face, imploring everyone in the arena to, to remember that at WrestleMania, he's, he's going to make good on his promise and he's going to make good on his lineage and all the other stuff. He's blown up about it. And I just liked how committed he was in the promo. But the fact that, right, commitment's great. He really believes this. Like, he really believes that he's really hungry for it, and he really thinks it's going to happen. And, and, you know, he really wants us all to believe in him, too. And that's all well and good. But literally, the the, the pathway to this has been filled with, with a certain hollow feeling that I just can't celebrate through and yes the hell in a cell match like i showed that to somebody just a few weeks ago and said this is why he's in line to win the title this one performance and at the moment i was okay with that but just through what we talked about last week there there it's 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 still just not enough it's just not enough to walk into the back into the company that you walked away from because you didn't want to have to play a comedy character and and also because you weren't getting over in your own company, it's true. Like mm-hmm. AEW fans were done with them. And I know I talked about that a lot last week. Check it out. This week I'm just still here saying it's still not enough for me. It it and I I'm I'm sorry. You're right. The in ring work is not very it's not varied. He's not added a ton of different wrinkles to his kit outside of I would say the Cody Cutter is the biggest new addition from old Cody in WWE uh. to current Cody. It's just the disaster kick, but utter. It, it, John Cena started doing it. It's just a John Cena move. John Cena did a springboard stunner. Which, Isn't that what the Cody cutter is? Isn't that just a springboard cutter? It's 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 a springboard like three quarters cutter because he lands on the ball of his shoulder every time Three-qu- he can't land on his oh back. Oh my god! Oh, this is this is some vanilla ice. It's different bullshit. I mean, he looks like Vanilla Ice, so we might as well keep it going. Anyway. This is like, saying, this is like trying to point out the difference between an RKO and a stunner. They're both kind of. One is a sit-down. So you'd think, what does Cody have to do to get us to believe it's time for him? And And I wonder if we could even talk about that right now. We've done a great job shitting on him, and we've done a really good job of saying how we're disenfranchised. But he's going to wrestle Roman. 
and it's a well, likelihood he's going to win. Is there anything he can do? Seriously, real question from me to you. Is there anything he can do to help you believe he belongs in that spotlight come WrestleMania? Like, what can he do? Oof. I don't know. Do entertaining matches. Okay. Like that's like that. It, it, when it comes down to it, you know, like my bias is, you know, the wrestlers I like, I pretty much vote for Daniel Bryan to go over every single guy. You know, there's not a single, especially a championship match where I don't feel like Daniel Bryan should win. And it's because every time he's on the microphone, he's talking about how he's going to beat people He's talking about why he should beat them. And a lot of times that's in place of like an actual storyline, unfortunately, because, you know, especially once he went to a like once he was the top guy in WWE, right? He just became like uh, 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 they have like roadblock wrestlers, as I call them. They have like speed bumps where it's like, hey, this guy was a, a former champion. Uh, throw him in there. And there's no real story going on, but he. He, he's a legitimate threat. He's he's a main eventer, you know? So he got stuck in that role for like a year or so um, before jumping ship to AEW where it just became dream match after dream match. So uh, when it comes down to it, it's I need a character element to get me hooked. I need... I need something that is not about the hype of... How great winning at WrestleMania is gonna be. I don't need someone to tell me how hard they fought or how hard life has been or how many challenges they've overcome. You know, I need someone who is cool and relatable and wants to fight and then actually puts on a good looking fight. Who is the epitome of the, a good looking fight to you in today's realm? Is it truly only Daniel Bryan and his style that you think deserves to be the top of the card? I'd say he's the most complete package because you can harp on technical wrestling all you want. Daniel Bryan has the best fucking strikes. Daniel Bryan has the best punch in the business, maybe. You know, like my biggest pet peeve, honestly, uh, at least like. The most common pet peeve I run into when I try to watch AEW is John Moxley punch. John Moxley just does not give a fuck about throwing a good looking punch, and it's depressing. So, <laughs> uh, you know, I could have put Big E up there actually for a minute. I mean, he's not exactly like a strong style kind of guy, but he's not doing shit that doesn't look good when he does it. He stays in his own lane. He was doing a lot of tag team wrestling. And, and then when he was champ and when he was main eventing, he was doing a lot of like multi-man matches. Um, so that really didn't expose him, I guess, is probably the best way to put it. But I could have put Big E up there just because every time he was doing something, it was like the right thing for him to do, for his match, for his body type. His, I think that's a big reason why he ended up getting that push. Uh, who else? Who else? There's there's a couple others. There's definitely a couple others. You know who I haven't seen wrestle in a while, but I could have put him up there. Aside for a few indie riffic moves, I think uh, Adam Cole could bring it. I think Adam Cole was doing a pretty good job at staying involved in matches, staying grounded in the match, and not taking me out of. It. Um, I think you miss guys like him and Pete Dunne. Um. We haven't seen yeah. Butch wrestle in way too long, if you ask me. And I, if they're not going to use that tag team anymore, I, I wish they would break him off because he's still one of the best wrestlers in the world who's not gotten his, you know, his intercontinental or U.S. Yeah. titles even, you know, let alone well, the big one. The, the I, other guy in that group is off TV because he's the one who hurt Big E, right? Oh, good old Ridge. Yeah, but Ridge Holland had plenty of TV time after immediately injuring Big E. Like, they gave him a good nine, ten months un really? okay. un unpunished, it seems. so. I just recently heard about... Two th I recently heard about Ridge getting death threats still for injuring the dude, and I've heard a, about a return to the Pete Dunn character. Good, please. I mean, there's no reason not to, especially since they've gone and really committed to the relationship between Drew and Sheamus. Mm -hmm. um, there's just no need to have Pete Dunne under some other moniker 
you know, any longer if they're not working as closely together. I mean, I talked a few weeks ago about how Pete was probably really enjoying getting to be Butch and drink from the Seamus pool. But if that's not happening so much, which it just seems like they've moved on, then yeah, let's pivot, change it up. Maybe after WrestleMania, because they've already written and filmed and are highlighting this this movie trailer version of um, Ridge, Seamus, and Pete going to get Ridge Holland a uh, uh, a Brazilian wax or whatever from from Forty Year Old Virgin. You know how they're doing the whole movie trailers for the Hollywood WrestleMania like they did ten years ago, and, and those were kind of fun. Well, they're doing them again, and Ridge Holland is in the latest one while everybody gathers around watching him getting his chest waxed like Forty Year Old Virgin. So. Um, oh, you, you know who else? Sorry, you know who else I could throw up there? Lucha Please Brothers. keep going. You I'll think throw... you want to see Ray Phoenix win a you know an AEW championship? No, I, you were just asking me as far as guys who have like a, a legitimate, uh, impressive in ring style. Like as far as like I'm not trying to go necessarily for like a. An MMA fight simulation okay. presentation, but just as far as guys who bring crunchy moves, you know, and Lucha Brothers are probably like the closest, you know, like the farthest on the spectrum because they definitely do a lot of. Uh, it's really funny because I always talk about how I'm not a big fan of like the Luchador style, but like nobody's doing it as good as Ray Phoenix, bro. Nobody does it as crisp, nobody does it as clean. You can say whatever you want. Rey Mysterio has never brought it like Rey Phoenix does. Interesting. Well, Rey, you know, Rey Mysterio inspired Rey Phoenix, and nobody is is gonna, you know. Oh, Rey absolutely. Would say, Phoenix would, would say to your face me. that's the case. But yeah, yeah, I can understand how you might feel he's he's evolved beyond what Rey Mysterio would do because I I, I do notice Rey Phoenix's move moves tend to have more crunch. There was just so much finesse to what Rey Mysterio innovated with, and now I just feel like Phoenix is bringing more physicality to it, and I'm sure one day he'll rise as the cream of the crop towards the top of a promotion. I think it's almost criminal, actually, that Rey Phoenix and Pentagon have both been so strapped to tag team work. I Maybe that's what they want, like, don't get me wrong, but as soon as they break them apart and put them in singles uh, situations... They should be perennial contenders as well. At some point, I'm gonna we're gonna kick this into like a retrospective podcast because there's so much stuff that you actually need to watch. Uh, Lucha Underground has some. Um, I forget. I think he was still Ray Phoenix. He might have had some other name, but it doesn't matter. It's, it's the same wrestler. There's some amazing single stuff from both those guys, but. Ray Phoenix especially has some of the better singles runs in Lucha Underground. And I, those guys are more in their prime back then, too. Yeah, it would be fun to see. I have seen, of course, the Pentagon Jr. You know, violence fest with Vampiro. That was... Yeah, that's not one I would actually recommend. <laughs> Although I probably am the reason you watched it. You probably are, and I remember it being memorable, unique, and I would watch it again. Um, oh, but... you know who would like that? Your roommate. That's true, but we don't need to make it a podcast about somebody we won't even name on the show. So, mm-hmm. um, Can I throw one out there for somebody with a great in-ring skill set that is perennially overlooked? Just don't say Chad Gable. Oh, you have oh, to fuck. Okay, take the next topic. Move on. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I was going to go with Ricochet today. Ricochet is still criminally, criminally underrated for what he can do in the ring with so many different body types of performers against him. Yeah, you want to talk about capable flippy dippy stuff. Um, My beef with Ricochet is that it looks like he would just bounce off me. Like, I feel like if he was trying to do his wrestling moves to me, the human being, he would bounce off me and make a cartoonish sound effect. (laughs) <laughs> but I would not feel threatened whatsoever. Okay. Well, that's probably what indicts. How about somebody even lower on the radar with the same body type so you can make fun of them too real quick, but at least I get to say their name in a sense. Ooh, How about love to. Cedric Alexander? Who? Oh, the other guy who wrestles with Shelton Benjamin and made rejoin the Hurt Business. Whoa, the one- Shelton Benjamin's wrestling again? 
Okay, we are 0 for 4. You can take the next topic after <laughs> all. <laughs> you can be mean to my picks if you want. Oh, it's hard. I like being agreeable. It's fun to actually go, yeah, you have a great point. A lot more fun than to be, hey, I'm taking a shit on your brain right now. But it's okay. I don't mind. It smells a bit terrible, but if that's what you want to do, my ideas don't have to matter. Um, I just haven't seen Cedric wrestle in so long I couldn't. Dude, go back and watch the Cruiserweight Classic match with him and Kota Bushi. Ooh, those were all bangers. God, yeah. I love the Cruiserweight Classic so much. Well, the first one was all bangers. True. The second one lost some teeth a little bit, if I remember correctly. But the UK tournament, same thing, right? Both of those were really good. Trips knew how to do tournaments back then, man. I I, I, do not love me a good tournament. Do not get me started on tournament wrestling because I just, the other day, maybe like 24 hours ago, not even, I was thinking to myself, you could run an entire promotion where you just do tournaments, right? And like the idea, so this all started, the super tangent, but it's fine. This is my podcast. Uh, it all started because I was thinking about what do belts mean in today's wrestling and why so many people like... It seems like everybody's a champion, and it seems like so many people have been multiple-time champions. And it's like, look at the guys who are the most over. They pretty much never have the records. And the the the, the legitimate, I guess you could say, record holders are guys from territory days. Like, Ric Flair's 16-time world championship record is impressive because he was getting it in multiple places. He was everybody's champion. He was over everywhere. That was a hallmark of him being over in multiple territories and being able to work near globally before that was a thing. Whereas John Cena's 16-time world championships are all with the same company, all with the same guy booking him, all with the same guy backing him. And so... We hate it. it. It loses its meaning. It's not as impressive. If anything, it brings into question what's more impressive, a long run or many runs. And, of course, John Cena's had some of the longest runs, too. But, you know, we can throw all those questions completely out the window. We can make our job as a wrestling promoter, as a booker, as a company owner, whatever, CEO, blah, blah, blah. We can make our jobs easier if we start fresh with a new idea and instead what if you held tournaments and whoever wins the tournament gets to hold the belt until the next tournament ah so do the uh diamond ring thing yeah they they do this kind of thing right king of the ring um they've had trophies i think japan does this regularly with g1 was it the G1 yeah, Climax? G1 Climax, yeah. Yeah, and people love that stuff. And and usually that is like for the mid-card guy to announce that he's leaving the mid-card or to move on up and stuff like that. But what if... And see, this, this goes along with my presentation idea of like doing a UFC-style presentation because I, I'm going to say this a lot throughout this podcast and as time goes on, it just becomes more and more true. I don't need to watch Seth Rollins wrestle twice a week. Love the dude. Does amazing ring work stuff. Someone I wanted to mention earlier, but like his character has fallen off really hard for me. Right. And like, I've just seen his matches so many times that I, I just can't get excited for a blackout stomp, you know, or whatever he's calling it now. And so I would love it if wrestlers could build up a fight the same way that like, MMA fighters do because then they could actually put their hands on each other you know you could get that tension you could get that trash talk and you could just do segments that don't really involve a wrestling match which is I don't know exactly how the attitude era became popular yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. like go seriously go back and watch how many times Stone Cold Steve Austin wrestles in a fucking match dude like actually the most over superstar of any given time more than The Undertaker, more than Ric Flair, more than Shawn Michaels. Anyone can get mad at me all they want, but he was more over than all of them. More over than The Rock, even. And he spends so little of his time in fucking wrestling matches. 
Well, I mean, the character, of course, was the anti-authoritative character. Why would the boss book him into opportunities to make money with every victory where you allegedly make more money when you pin the guy, right? Like, it it's something that would almost work into the storytelling. And, but I'm with you that there is such a thing as being overexposed, and we have talked about how Seth especially is overexposing himself a ton. And he's doing it because, once again, he's jealous of the fact he's not top guy. And, you know, uh, that's got my my underlining, you know, my highlighter is over the, the Seth Rollins-Logan Paul match at WrestleMania because, as I said last week, if Logan wins, I think Seth is going to take that as a personal shot against him. And we start seeing him work his way out of the E at some point. So... I, I I really do think that's a really potential volatile situation, but he is making a mistake of wrestling so many matches. It's 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 an understandable perspective. We don't need to be overexposed by him, um, to him. We know what he's capable of, and he's not adding a ton of different wrinkles right now to his in ring work. He just keeps trying to fluidly adjust his 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 mic character, I guess, and. You know, it's a dangerous place to be because either you're going to be really good at adapting new wrinkles into your kit or you're going to overexpose yourself and, and see your way out of the contention for top tier star. So he's he's oh, it's going to be really interesting. That matchup is where a, a big part of my brain is at. Yeah, that one's uh, got some interesting ramifications to it. And it has a chance to steal whatever night of WrestleMania gonna be on. I mean, that's mm -hmm. uh, that's its own topic. Is a multi-night WrestleMania just has to fucking stop, dude? <laughs> it's just you don't get to take up two nights of my life. I'm sorry. I'm just I'm gonna be skipping shit. You know, like if the Super Bowl was two nights, people would not. Win. I mean it. I... I don't know if I'm against the two night format all that hard. I, 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 I mean, I don't get to watch a weekend straight of wrestling and haven't in years, you know? So I know eventually I'll just be taking it in in baby bites when I can. And, um, you know, I'll be, I'll be grateful for what I do get to enjoy, but I mean, it's either one mega lawn freaking show or it's two, decent chunks and it's obviously a great cash grab for the e they get two days of monstrous gate grabs right like it Russell. only makes sense it's business in the in the in the moment for them on site that yeah. totally justifies the double date why would they change it for it, the convenience of us that it, don't matter <laughs> it also it's another day that people who travel to go to it have to be able to afford. So then you make sure that you're only getting like the bougiest of people. And then it's that the, way you can a, raise ticket yeah. prices. Cause at that point people who are going to go are going to pay right. any price to go. And they, they give out like a full third of the tickets anyways, as tax write offs, so whatever. Capitalism is hard at work. They're not giving away, uh, I would think, not as many tickets at a WrestleMania as they are at your weekly SmackDown event. So, you know, I, 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 it's it's capitalism. Welcome to it. We've been doing it a couple centuries now. America's probably not going to deviate. So buckle up. Pretty <laughs> soon we'll have a we'll have a whole load before it deviates. Let's totally not do a political podcast let's just point out that eventually wrestlemania is just going to be a week-long event every single day of the week we'll have four matches and you know we're gonna pony up all of our money to be able to attend at, at, at every single episode or every single event and you know that's just that's just how it's gonna work we're just gonna evolve into it assuming that wrestling wrestling continues to to grow into such a premier entertainment you know, um, outlet as it has been these last couple of years since AEW came in and really started to shake up people's perception of who's doing it right and who's doing it wrong. I so, just, get, buckle up, man. Lawn WrestleManias are just, just getting started. I'm but, just, 
tired of wanting to be a fan of something that I'm willing to skip so much of. You know? <laughs> oh no! Like it's just, it's so tough. I mean, dude, every time you and I have tried to watch a pay per view, right? At some point, I'm like, can we please skip this? And you're like, no, I don't want to skip anything. And then by the time the main event comes around, you're you're asleep. It's true. You know, true. And I'm like, if you want to watch good matches or if you want to watch the important ones, you're going to have to pick and choose, not just because the shows are too long or because there's too much actual garbage fucking wrestling out there that has like no, no reason to exist, you know? But on top of that, just because as a human being in your 30s, you can't do that to yourself anymore. I don't know. I... I don't know if I'll ever truly outgrow wrestling because I've always loved it and I've always been naturally drawn to it. And I see things that these guys do that help them to succeed and fail. I have found myself predicting who would make main event pushes at some point, like for years. And I'd like to think that I'm not having a knack for perceiving this stuff for fun. But as we were getting into this portion of the lore there's something off kilter about how valid it feels like i thought triple h had done such a good job building momentum of his uh, of his oh, booking and his work as as the new head of all this but this wrestlemania is almost like watching them take three or four steps back there are some parts oh. of it that have been beautifully uh, you know orchestrated and and are at least quality storytelling to give us something to look forward to sure but we've talked at nauseum about how the outcomes of those matches don't feel like they could rightfully go towards a new change for guys like the usos and for roman to drop their titles to their respective opponents it seems like a misstep an incorrect move in the wake of how effectively they've built up who they would be supplanting. And, you know, I I think that's the biggest problem with the current product in the WWE outside of the fact that they're also booking Brock Lesnar and Omos on the same card. Like, that's an attraction. <laughs> Why is that an attraction? Omos is a gigantic jobber because he squashes all the little jobbers, sure, but he doesn't he has there's no reason for us to believe he's going to to take over the monster role from Brock. We haven't watched almost wrestle a legitimate match that you can call into question his opportunity to lose since he did lose to Bobby Lashley, you know, so why am I in a hurry to think Brock is going to be you know just the latest victim? I'm not dude Brock is. <laughs> totally likable in his role right now and he's near the top of the industry still he's having the best time of his life in the wrestling world right now i'm just bummed that match exists it's just a buzz kill not mm -hmm. to mention the entire swirling ambiguity and inconsistency of the reports versus the results you know with the bray wyatt bobby lashley matchup as well like are you doing it or are you not because each show that passes, we're not seeing Bray like show up and get the momentum back going or talk about anything or ramble about anything. So we don't know if that's mm. happening. Now you're wasting somebody you put legitimate work into with Bobby. So it's just really disjointed right now. And it it's not as clean as past WrestleMania builds have been. Excuse me. Go ahead. It's funny you mentioned Bray Wyatt there because almost is fitting the role. That Bray Wyatt did for a long time. Ah, uh, okay. The jobber to the stars. You build right. him up as a monster by having him squash actual jobbers, and then people go, well, this guy can't be a jobber. He wins matches. And then he goes up against an actual main eventer, and he puts them over because he's this monster character who squashes everyone else. Cool, and then you life. just get this unbelievable ridiculous whiplash that somehow ends up with seth rollins getting disqualified from a hell in a cell match uh -huh. and then we're gonna cancel the hell in a cell pay-per-view <laughs> oh Boy. my goodness man i you know so two things i've been watching a lot recently that um i have a little bit of context to this 
conversation. I went back and I've been watching early NXT. Okay, like 20, 2012 NXT? Like uh, like network era NXT. Okay. Not like game show NXT. Right. Like, uh, like NXT TakeOver Arrival number one. Sure. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Um, it's so wild to see Sami Zayn. <laughs> and, and like... Uh, it starts with Cesaro versus Sami Zayn, right? And it's just yeah, what a wonderful time capsule because Cesaro is now back in Ring of Honor, technically of all places, as a champion, as Ring of Honor World Champion. Last I looked, he might not be it and, anymore. And still, by the way, even as ROH champion, he's still the third best guy in his faction. Right. <laughs> when you look at the billing, Moxley's right at the front center for any Blackpool Combat Club thing. He's yeah. he's right at front and center, and 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 it's just so weird to me. It's like if for me, if there's a world champion in your stable, they're at the front of the pack, regardless of who's around them. Right. Like I mean that I I'm a I hate multiple belts in your fucking federation. Right. Like this is. This is the issue where one of them is Tony Khan's company, the other is his side project. Right. Well, he's trying to monopolize the notion of being WWE's opponent, is what it seems like. He'll yeah. network with everybody outside the E and just try to get as many friends to go, yeah, we're sticking up for the little guys, you know. Cool. Um like look at look at these two guys, right? Cesaro and Sami Zayn, where for years people looked at both of them and went, Man, when's this guy gonna get his push? When's this guy gonna have his rightful time at the top? And then Cesaro sorta gets his push, not really WWE. You could say it got derailed by like the teeth thing, not being able to give a promo, whatever. Goes over to AEW, he's the hottest thing since sliced bread because who the fuck is it when they debut in AEW? And then within a couple months, it's like, ah, well, you know, we don't we don't want you to be our world champion, but you, but, but you can be a world champion, you know? Mm -hmm. And he's, like, dredging up old feuds, and it's, it, it's very reminiscent of, like, a Sami Zayn buildup where years later, it's like, oh, he's actually managed to find his way into the main event picture and we're gonna pop the crowd in his hometown where he gets to just fucking lose and we'll give him a throwaway tag team match with his best friend at wrestlemania because hey man they're friends and it's on their bucket list i'm tired of the friendship bullshit storylines i'm tired of the bucket list wrestling that's the problem cody rhodes is a bucket list wrestler no oh, yes well he's entitled He's entitled, and I want it to stop. The only yeah. thing that can help Cody feel like he's a legitimate winner is actually to lose. And I think he needs it. And I th hope he knows that. Like, as close as he has come to being ready for his title match and, and his big title victory in the sun, and I, I do think he should get it, what feels awful about him near the top of the card right now is that he is behaving and is being booked as if he is entitled to it. And that just doesn't taste right to me. You well, know? I mean, he is entitled to it. He certainly won that uh, Royal Rumble there. The Come back and return at, uh, what number did he return? Oh, yeah, the 30th spot. <laughs> the last guy, the one that folks get to win from if, like, you're just, so big a star that you don't need to be paid by the hour tonight, but thank you. <laughs> Undertaker won from 30. Respect that in 2007. Cena won it from 30 the night that he returned way too early from his injury. Like, those are for, like, real special people. Didn't Edge win from 30? Somebody will probably correct uh, me that I'm wrong, but I, I, well, I might be wrong. But Yeah, so... The, if, Ed, if Edge did win from 30, it's almost certainly as a heel, right? Not as a turning babyface after 10 years. What's funny is that Cena and Taker were also babyfaces winning from 30. But uh, 
Like, I mean, when you're I doing the return like, angle, I just didn't want to. When, yeah, man, do a number you, two or ten no, or twelve. When, I don't know. When you're doing the return angle, it's fine. It's cool because it's supposed to be a big surprise that he's finally back. And like Cena came back so early, no one expected it. But they fucking announced Cody is coming back for the Rumble. They didn't yeah. give him a big surprise return spot. If there was no buildup, if there's no expectation, maybe, maybe we feel differently now. But we were told from the beginning Cody Rhodes is going to win this. My biggest complaint is that I can pick a winner. You know, out of 30 random entrants, I can pick the winner. It feels right. Like, we know who it's going to be, and that's fucking bullshit. <laughs> Yeah, like I well, want some real, I want real randomness. Like, okay, I think did it, we probably mentioned this when we were doing the Royal Rumble episodes, right? If I were going to book a Royal Rumble in my pro wrestling company, honest to God, you know what I would do? Oh, you would um, stack it with all of your favorite wrestlers and no, 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 roll the no. dice. I wouldn't stack it with all my favorite wrestlers. I would put in all the people I'm going to have work it. And then I would have three randomly decided winners between all, all 30 spots. You know, I'd roll the dice three times, right? And if one person wins two out of three or whatever, like we're just going with that person, they win. And we're going we're gonna to figure it out. You know, we're going to plan ahead, obviously, so you can build and blah, blah, blah. We're going to plan ahead and actually have random fucking winners. And have a way to write it if I don't know Baron Corbin wins the Royal Rumble, like you know, like it's not it should not be that unbelievable that out of thirty people you can cause enough mayhem and be in the right place to fucking win a Royal Rumble. It's it's been proven to be very easy to throw people over the top rope. <laughs> so like Sometimes I would do stuff all like you that. Need like, is your prize. Yeah, like if I get three different winners, right? The odds that all three of them are total duds or total stinkers, like people I can't possibly go with or write a story around is pretty low, I would think, I would hope, right? Like, I'm still putting legit guys in there. Um, and even if not, like, there's no rules. I can just re-roll again. But <laughs> but the thing is, is, like, it it would... I think that there's a lot of creative methods, right? There's a lot of different ways to be creative, and for someone like me and for the things I've done, as far as storytelling goes, um, using randomness as a spark of inspiration. And wrestling is like kind of, the wrestling is kind of guilty of this idea a lot anyways, where there is justification. Like, uh, what's the term? Not posthumously, but like after the fact, right? Retroactively. Like, yeah, retroactive justification of things. And, like, there's so many wrestling matches where I can just see the way these guys are sitting in the back and they're talking it through and they're like, oh, cool, I'll do this and then we'll end up over here and then we'll do this. And, like, you can see where they thought it made sense or, like, you can walk through it from, like, a very narrow, like, first-person perspective where it makes sense. But they never think of it, like, from an audience point of view. Okay. You know, you can see where they think like, oh, it'll be cool if I do this into this into this. Like, But when you actually watch it through, it doesn't really make sense. There's a lot of wasted motion or they didn't think of like, uh, uh, I think we, we talked about with the Sasha, Sasha uh, Mercedes money. It's actually money now. That's what everyone's pronouncing gross. it as. Just it, gross. It's bad. Can we just call her Sasha Banks? Anyway, uh, so between her and... um. Kyrie, right? Like I, I mentioned a lot of where like they would do like a really cool spot. It would just be like just good pro wrestling. And then you could tell they're like out of position for the next thing. So they just gotta kinda like pick each other up and walk to the next spot. Or they did a lot of throwing, you know, a lot of pushing into ring posts and stuff to make sure that we're we're getting to the spot. And so right. um there's a lot of stuff where like if you're blocking that match out you're talking through it you're like oh well i'll throw you into the ring post and then i'll pick you up and i'll i'll go to do it again and then you reverse me and that'll buy us halfway across the ring like yeah that that makes sense that's cool but there's gonna be like two or three steps after that where all of a sudden it's like okay why the fuck are we actually here 
why are we outside the ring for this long? You know, who's who's winning in the Irish whip you into stuff match? You know what I mean? Like, whose strategy is this now? And like, I don't know. There, there's a lot of there's a lot of times where this is really apparent in John Moxley matches. I think too, where he's just like, it'll be cool if we do this into this into this thing. But he doesn't realize that like the part where he gets out of the ring to go find the weapon is taking away from them. Well, fair enough. Everybody's got their style, but they're not always doing a seamless job or a believable job or a reasonable job of creating a fight around their next uh, spot, their next move, their next plan. And when so many guys do have their own unique way of presenting their ultimate violence, like Moxley and his various weaponry, you know, it, it does kind of defeat the feeling that you're watching something that's an actual organized sport or an actual athletic competition. And you're more like, Oh, that's the thing he likes to do where he <laughs> sets this up and then goes, oh, there's his own blood. Yeah, exactly. Um, that's where I was going with that. It's it's a certain type of disjointedness in the presentation of each individual's match flow that can kind of limit the potency of the product. But at the same time, it, it adds some much-needed variation because look at what I've been saying about especially AEW matches for a long time. They're all almost cookie-cutter versions of each other because everybody does the same series of spots and the same decision making so then it's like well what the fuck is the point if everybody can do a top atomico why am i freaking the fuck out exactly you know? so it's it's weird you got to find that balance of brush strokes of story that actually feel like legitimate competition and there are artists to it you're right that's the stuff that makes you realize why bret hart was bret hart why daniel bryan's daniel bryan and there are very few others who have wasted so little movement. And I'm really only saying Bret Hart because of the reputation. But, you know, Brian's right up there with the best of not making anything feel out of place. I think MJF is getting better. Um, I feel like um, Chris Jericho is getting worse. Um, <laughs> yeah, Jericho, but- it's so funny. You watch, like you know, like mid two thousands, like right after the undisputed title run, Jericho's talked a lot about not being ready for that spotlight, you know, needing to, to learn and get better and stuff. And you can really see like his, his every night, like in the ring movement is so good. And the matches he does are just, at least on pay-per-views, you know, I don't watch like the Monday Night Raws too often, but his pay-per-view matches are always, like, such good, It's sometimes mini, you know, sometimes, like, encapsulated stories. But, like, they're all just such a good little story to tell. And then he hits, like, that highlight of the night stage where he's like, okay, well, I'm not really getting a push. I'm not going to be a main eventer, and I'm just here, like, week in and week out. And he just starts to get the repetitions. He's just here to do, you know... Springboard drop kick, no more lion salt. We've now added an in Inseguri, and you know maybe we'll hit a walls of Jericho and and win the match, or maybe we just job out. You know, mm-hmm. yeah, it's that that I need to start preserving my body for a long career stage. So that that's a big part of it too, man. Yeah, you know, um, pretty much every pro wrestler regrets some part of their move set. Almost every pro wrestler regrets whatever finishing move they have because of just the wear and tear it 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 takes on your body so like maybe these guys shouldn't wrestle four or five times a week we've talked about that for a while and we've hinted that we have a whole discussion coming about you know rotating the guys and gals who are used week in and week out day in and day out month in and month out all that other good stuff and letting letting each wrestler come in and have like a season to, to do their thing and then back out. And you know that can't who, be real quick. I feel you, like, you know who they've done a really good job with that on. Oh, you know who um, you're not sour on from AEW. I mean, there's a handful of guys who I'm not sour on from AEW. So but I mean, like I'm, in this obvious current context of not over. 
I suppose somebody who is still near the top of the card in AEW, who I feel like I haven't seen a ton of recently, is probably mm, Kenny Omega. Mm, no, not even close, because he was just... Uh, no, Hook. Hook is undefeated, as far as I know. I'm very certain he's not taking a loss. Every time he comes out, he pretty much gets a pop. There's like a little, there's a little while where he's coming out a little, a little too often and, and just like having a three second match, you know, and it, and it works. It works if you're doing it right, but he wasn't like full on goal breaking it, but he's still undefeated and nobody's like tired of him. But in AEW, it's also like you just go ghost for four to six months. So you can lose all your steam that way, right? If, if you're never around. So there's got to be something in the meantime to build up those matches, right? To to hype things up, but you know, I want to see I want to see some builds like Hook. I want I I can't wait for Hook's first, you know, major program. I'm surprised he becomes part of the conversation only in that he's being booked by his dad. And <laughs> he gets to wear his dad's title. He gets to wrestle three second matches. He gets to flip his ridiculous hair. And he gets to leave. And, and he gets to have that ridiculous theme song. I know. I like the theme song too. It's pretty tight. The thing is, is that cool. He's fresh and he's, un, you know, he's not exposed a whole lot, but he also hasn't had to show us a ton. And sure, you could be excited for his first major program, but you could say the same thing for like Jade Cargill for similar reasons except she's overexposed or or just awkwardly Ugh. exposed because despite winning she doesn't actually get any upward momentum from that like it's so strange with that um and like why does she have to cut a promo every night you know just like do do a match to remind us that you're here because your matches aren't doing enough even <laughs> though you have a title belt like it's it's just really strange booking there too i feel like different people with certain experience levels around the business just take turns booking like specific storylines in aew you know Steen's in control of darby and taz mm -hmm. is there for hook and you know the blanchard is there for the blanchard dad totally sorry he's there for ftr you know and everybody like just takes their stars and it's like i'll make them look good don't worry about them like i'll just you know I got them. Christian helped Jungle Boy. You know, like yeah. everybody's got like their their um their godfather, their 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 um their fairy wrestle parent. Um so I I feel like on in my gut, my favorite way to watch people cr climb to the top, there's there's really two different ways. There's the spectacle elevation like Royal Rumbles and Money in the Banks and King of the Rings, but King of the Rings is a little bit of both of my types because the other type is tournaments. I think you can get anybody over, especially the ones who are all hustle and no character, you can get anybody over in tournaments. Like, where the point where if you have personality and you can tell a story with your character and be in a tournament, like you're overachieving extremely because... <laughs> Tournament formats are are the best way to take a couple of blank looking faces, oh have them goodness. beat the piss out of each other, and you come out with bigger respect oftentimes for both of them. And I I wish that Cody had won a tournament, you know, <laughs> at the very least to get number he thirty. He won the Royal Rumble. That's a major accomplishment. A huge feather in the cap. They certainly don't just pick whoever's the hottest name. But it, just uh, sarcasm, 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 because <laughs> they did pick the hottest name. They yeah. put him in the cushiest spot. They, they, they He's just um, returning from injury. They're just returning from injury. <clears throat> and, you know, like I said, I remember Gunther uh, way before I remember Cody Rhodes in that in that evening, you know. So I just. He did, he wasn't even the biggest star of the night, you know, and now he's going to be the, the the WrestleMania challenger. Oh, just give me a tournament, man. Win a tournament. I I don't know. I'm just. Do you know I why would, you like tournaments so much? Because you get to know them as workers so much better than all of the other stuff. 
It's because there's built in anticipation. It's because you can look ahead and you can see the potential matches and you can start to be excited and you can decide who you want to win and where. Because when it's a Royal Rumble, you're like, well, I want one guy to win. When it's, right. a triple, when it's a triple threat match at WrestleMania for the title, you're like, well, I want one guy to win. When it's a tournament, you have probably eight matches to start with and you get to pick eight winners you want. And then in the next round, you get to pick four winners that you want. And you get to decide how like far you want each guy to go and stuff like that. And it's got its own build. It's got a, a pre-built build up to these things. You know, it's got great ways to start feuds. And like there's so much you can do with the tournament format that just doesn't get done. Um I it's think... the inertia of, of anticipation. You're right. It's naturally its own model for just relatable, basic excitement that grows naturally. It just does it naturally. And when you're in a tournament setting, wins and losses feel like they matter. Amen. It's so true. And I just, I just like when my first exposure to certain talent is through those, is through those tournaments. I've loved the UF, I love the UK stuff. I love the CWC. I love the Mayon Classics. Those are just smart, well booked ideas. I used to love the King of the Ring tournament when it was done traditionally. I, I just, it's just, it's such an easy way of helping individuals to stand out through their in ring work and then also get elevated. Even folks who lose those tournaments become the most memorable parts. And I just, I'm so tired of the notion of being force-fed anybody right now. And, you know, I, I, oh, I'm I, just so nauseated that <laughs> Cody has been silver spooning his way into this scenario despite a track record that says like actually I don't I don't want him uh, he's not ready to be at the top of the card I hope Roman beats him I said this all last week so take the topic yeah. away to somewhere else Uh well okay do you think that uh we want Roman to win the main event now do you want the Usos to retain the undisputed tag team title belts well, I mean, I do feel like I touched on this last week how, yeah, where the build is going, as as much um, history as Kevin and Sammy have in the ring together, it's almost universally as opponents. This right. is not a brotherly tag team. The, the Usos have been building a record-setting reign off of their brotherhood, their blood, they're legitimate, I've known you since we came out of the womb at the same time status. Like, there's no reason for me, even as a fan, to think that the single greatest tag team on the record books in WWE history is going to lose to essentially two guys who are a coin flip away from tolerating to hating each other, you know? And the bipolar brothers, but, but I'm not here to talk shit about two of my favorite wrestlers because Sammy and Kevin are, I love watching them work. I think they're perennially un, unexplored as top talent. I have no qualms with them getting good airtime and I don't even, I don't even mind them being a tag team, but they shouldn't be knocking off the most effectively built tag team of this generation. They just don't need to. That's they're just not, not the right answer. They're not tag team stars. And they haven't been teaming for a while. It makes basically no sense why they would even stand a candle in the flames chance of of winning this match, you know, especially as baby faces. Like there's there's just nothing that says that they should win this match clean other than pure unbridled uh fighting spirit hulking up, you know. I I've really hated what they've done to Sami Zayn's character, i.e. Right. it's completely gone. Right. It's when just... he turned heel, he wore he put on this peel of, you know, being uh always under attack, right? And always the the guy who's He was the victim. The, the victim. Right. Yeah. The sniveling, also cowardly type of victim. You know, yeah, the, the victim one who... complex. He was a conspiracy theorist. He was. Oh, wait. You mean he felt entitled to bigger things without actually earning them? 
yeah. strange. <laughs> it's almost like he's the main event baby face right now. Right. And then uh, when, I mean, for some reason, when he goes baby face, like he just, he has no more motivation. He has no more schemes. He's just, I'm going to hype this match up. And then you've got Cody Rhodes just, basically bogarting off his hype right you've got cody just kind of i don't know riding his coattails trying to be involved with him you know what i mean like it it it's corny it's just corny it's just cody has no substance he's just there to hype up the crowd Right, but I would like to stri- try to stay away from m- the continuation of the Cody hate only in that <laughs> with Sammy and well, we're, Kevin. We're, we're inching away. We're inching away. Sammy and Kevin are probably going to win because, you know, they deserve something coming out of this, especially Sammy. And my hope is is that they have a decent, you know, baby face run with the tag team titles, beating some great teams because they're capable of it. But then, right. I mean, I'm hoping that they get to turn heel together and they get to go back to like a bludgeoning Being version of Kevin Owens, <laughs> a bludgeoning version of Kevin Owens and Sammy going to be like the the heater of the two, you know, helping them to snake their way out of title situation or, you know, retentions. Um, <laughs> that's that's what I'm hoping will happen. It's the only way that I think that the those characters get to be more interesting. But as I said last week, um, you know, if they're right. gonna win this massive payoff, then it needs to change them somehow. It needs to, it needs to change. Like the, you, you give them the titles just so they can lose them in a couple months to a no name team would be a humongous mistake. As I said last week, uh, we have a historic tag team dropping the titles to the Usos who go on to be a historic tag team to drop the titles to Kevin and Sammy. They better be a historic tag team or they are wasting everybody's right. time. Right, right, right. You know? Okay. What do you want to see Solo Sokoa do at WrestleMania? Does he have a match? What is he supposed to do? So I'm grateful Solo Sokoa is getting more time to look deep into Roman's eyes and feel as if he's being underestimated by his head of the table, older cousin. Um, I'm I'm also grateful Samo- uh, so- Solo has had an opportunity to wrestle Kevin Owens and just get a lot of good in-ring work uh, right now. And I've hinted last week that maybe he's the one who gets to blossom into a star capable of toppling either Roman or... Or if Cody wins, maybe he is the one to beat Cody. Um, There is a fantastically interesting legitimacy to the way he's been booked that tells me (laughs) that they understand they're dealing with a, a future star here and they've been building him very effectively. And yet, you know, they have recently established that, you know, he's not. Okay. trusted by Roman to be capable of being a main eventer, but you've got a point here you want to make. Go ahead. Yeah, what what do you want to see him do at WrestleMania? Um, let's see. Who's the... Who... Like, Damn. we're talking WrestleMania build. We talked what we want to see Roman do. We talked what we want to see the Usos do. The only one left is Solo Sokoa. What do you want to see him do at WrestleMania? What is his purpose in this fucking bloodline? He's going to be the one to cost Roman the title. Yeah, he's going to he's going to finally stand up to him. I mean, somebody needs to, but right now with the way that they're planting seeds, they're putting Roman uh, you know, they did the whole like, "No, Solo, this is not your time. You're not right. ready." You know. Not ready. Yeah. Um, and that's the one thing that can make a Solo type of character who's just blind rage fueled apparently and loosely loyalty based with the family. Um, go like, uh, no, I'm, I am ready. And then he'll go straight for the guy who says he's not ready. So So you want to see him cost Roman the title at WrestleMania? It, it, it makes it a little easier for me to swallow the Roman loss to Cody. And it creates, uh, something else for Roman to do post title. Um, and it helps val it helps elevate solo 
who is the next Roman, if I'm being honest. I do think Roman's time with us is not much longer. He doesn't have a reason for it to be. So the la- the last thing he can do is help continue to create the stars out of his family. He's done too he's done so much for Jay especially. Jimmy too by association, but the Usos are set. They're good. They've got a legacy. They're yeah. they're far underrated at this point. So now Solo gets to be the guy who gets a rub by working with his cousin and hopefully beating him. I mean, what else can you do for the business if you're Roman right now except give up some pretty important losses? So that is the most important thing he can do is on his way out, whether it's by directly beating him or not, he's got to help Solo get over. Because I think you're right. I don't think there's too much left for his career. Um, <clears throat> he's he's managed to salvage his career, and like wrestlers don't like to retire early. But man, if if Roman retires shortly after this title run, uh, I think it would cause people to look back on his career way more fondly than they probably even currently do. I am already totally uh, respectful of Roman. Uh, uh, This title reign and the stories (laughs) they've told, of course I acknowledge him. He has grown into everything we had hoped he would become as fans who were sick of seeing babyface Roman, you know, (laughs) Stuff down yeah, I, I I acknowledge the tribal chief. I got nothing for the big dog. You got nothing for the big dog, right? Exactly. Yeah. That I, character. I acknowledge the tribal chief and the bloodline. I do not fucking pop for the big dog. Right, and you know there were two different approaches to get the same guy over, but the way he totally confidently and naturally filled the role of the head of the table and shed so many different pieces of dead weight from the uh, big dog character. Just, he did it deftly. He did it with packed with subtleties. He did it really by, by really embracing that less is more approach. He did it by communicating his character's goals. Like True that, that. Was, that was the main thing was he sat there and he's like, all right, this is who I am, you know, listed his accomplishments. And he said, and this is what I want, you know, and it's, it's, a you know, I mean, it plays out the same way every time, right? The heel goes to the ring and he tells you how good he is. And he tells you that you need to cheer for him, you know, I mean, it's the the we already mentioned Jericho once on the podcast, so I'm gonna gonna get yeah, it. Yeah, we got our again. Jericho quota set. Yeah, but Jericho used to just go to the ring and go, "You like me? You really like me?" And everyone would boo him. And it's just right. it's that simple, you know. And it's the same thing told with a different motivation, right? Like Jericho's character was aloof and a bimbo. He was a himbo. You know, and and the the motivation was to get uh to get heat for being annoying, just being wrong. You know, and Roman goes to the ring and does you know his own version of the thing, and the goal is to shed light on his legacy and his family's legacy, and to cement himself as someone who can do good work. You know, to cement himself as. The guy that we all cheered for doing triple power bombs, not the guy who we fucking booed for doing his seventh Superman punch in a row. I counted. Yuck. Yeah, those are just not entertaining matches. But I have an interesting question for you. What's up? Are there any non bimbo heel champions? If you if you can say Roman and Chris Jericho and their heel title roles were actually just redressed versions of each other, then let's roll through a couple of well, heel champions and wonder, are they bimbos too? Because I wouldn't say that it's a redressed version. Like I'm not saying Roman's a bimbo, but I'm saying that like in wrestling, it's biblical. It's good versus evil, and everything kind of branches off from there you know um 
it, it's it's everything in wrestling has been done. It's mostly about the flavor and the the character motivations. You know, the acknowledge me is the same thing as Daniel Bryan coming to the ring and telling you you're polluting the planet and you need to look to him for guidance. You need to follow his example. Acknowledge my example of living green. You know, um, fucking CM Punk literally would come out to the ring and say, I can save you because I'm straight edge. You know, how many times has Jericho a, gone out there and said, I'm going to save you? You could be a better American if you follow JBL as heel champion. Yeah, you know, like it, J, uh, JBL would ask you to acknowledge him as a wrestling god. You know? Oh yeah, that's funny. That's true. I mean, right. he didn't ask for acknowledgement. He just told you what he was. But well, I mean, some. But I mean, he, he would also phrase it as like you know, <laughs> recognize you know, realize that I'm a wrestling god. It's undeniable. You have to say it. You know, it's again. It it's it's all about having that character twist to it. It's all about having the right like. It, to me, it's the difference between being like a heel character and being the Miz. Is MJF a bimbo heel champion? Uh, I mean, I don't, I don't know I'm why you're better stuck on the you. bimbo part, but like, I, I don't think he's a bimbo. No, because he's not aloof. He's not like that specific version of Jericho. The whole point was he didn't he didn't acknowledge reality you know that was goofy funny jericho who would uh that was right before the man of a thousand and four holds it's silly comedy Jericho. <clears throat> his character was overly stupid for comedic value which you know you gotta love that a little comedy yeah. is always a smart move um it, it though it has held back Jericho off and on here or there uh, from being taken seriously by the super big thinkers in these businesses, but um, you, you know, know he's held his own and reinvented himself enough times to make it work. But we yeah, don't. I don't think color. MJF has ever been like stupid for comedic value. He is. He does do these like really great moments of naivete where he thinks he's in control of the moment, and then somebody you know lampoons him. So. It's happened. Um, he's he has definitely over the top reaction, but I wouldn't say his characters. He's cut from a pretty similar cloth to Jericho as far as personality is concerned. I mean, how else could they pull off that really fun singing segment of all things on AEW uh, a couple of years ago? It was yeah, fun. It was, it was pretty a... close to some bimbo bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> but hey, you know, I. I think Roman has done an amazing job putting a big fat bandaid on the worst parts of his career and fully done everything he can do to, you know, leave us almost wanting more. Um, I think if he were to drop the title, give up a couple key losses, um, I still think Jey Uso needs to beat him. I think, I think they're making a mistake by having Jey Uso continue to follow so nonchalantly in line with Roman for this tag team title match, but that's the mistake of putting the titles on them and knowing that eventually they've got to give them up, you know, but I do think at some point there will be a Jay Uso going, okay, I'm done with this bullshit. And then he and Roman need to fight. Um, maybe it's a continuation from solo beating a Roman and then, you know, Jay thinking he's good enough to beat him or something. I don't know, but I do think Roman there, gives up. Why is there no rival faction? Why is everybody going in there solo? <laughs> I mean, solo. No pun Sokoa. intended, yeah. Yeah, why is everyone going in there solo, getting their ass beat, <clears throat> and having the bloodline reign over them as a four or five person ensemble, and the whole locker room doesn't come out and beat their ass? You know, um. You remember when, you remember when evolution was just fucking on people for over a year? Finally, the whole fucking locker room, I'm pretty sure faces and heels together just got tired of their shit and were like, Hey, let's book a lumberjack match. I definitely don't remember that specific turn of events, but you have a great point. 
anytime there's a dominant faction, you'd think everybody else in the locker room would just be like, hey, you know, temporary truce. Can we? You guys down? <laughs> Some top um, baby faces. You know, the Hogan method was you set up a whole stable of heels for him to run through to get to the end. And by the time you get to the late 80s and 90s, he's always teaming up with somebody, whether it's Macho Man or Lex Luger or whatever. You know, at some point, it's like, well, it's just, just half the roster is fucking getting together. So, like, I don't know. It just, it, it's the whole thing with Sammy being like, we need to team up and, like, I don't know. I don't want to go back to that. It It's... It, it's just silly. It's just silly where we've ended up. It's really sad that they missed out on a great opportunity to just make Sami Zayn the champion. <clears throat> they're just there. There's there is a certain amount of commitment to the course that seems to be um, left over from the Vince regime, where you know the seeds that have been laid must be laid and that is it and he's coming he, back so i just i don't want to man it makes me want to throw <laughs> up um like there's a certain amount of like no pivoting no matter what that i wish felt didn't exist in the largest of the wrestling spotlights because i like surprises and I enjoy surprises, and Royal Rumble's wonderful because there's so much potential for surprise, as we've talked about in the past. Mm -hmm. And there's just not enough surprise in what's happening with this year's WrestleMania, which has the whole thing leaving me, as I said when we opened the show tonight, just plateaued. It's nothing against who's in the actual contests, except for Cody. Um, <laughs> it's just that there isn't something that feels like like i don't know what's gonna happen you know i just feel like we've we've been here and we've done it and there don't there doesn't seem to be true ramifications out outside of the meta thinking i'm doing over logan and um beth i just struggle to think like where's like the, can we get the writing off the wall like i'm tired of looking at it I want right. to. I want there to be some shock value, and I love that you made a theme of tonight's conversation randomization, because, you know, outside of the random decision to make Jinder Mahal a WWE champion, that <laughs> there's still hope for that type of decision making. There's still hope, where like let's just throw some shit at the wall and make sure we do our best to make it work. You know, let's just try it and. um there's just not a whole lot of that in today, right now, in their in their version of pro wrestling, especially in the E. So, the and AEW's version of surprises are just kicking dirt off of pieces that they've had that they 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 sometimes think are low card, and now are all of a sudden like, oh, you're mid to upper mid card right now because oh my you god, know, Stu Grayson is all elite again. I I'm I am definitely lost on the significance of that sentence. Like, why do I care? Like, you I know he's a member of the dark. You don't. Order. Nobody nobody does. People who think they care don't. They're just lying because they want something that they believe in to be important. They're lying to themselves and to you. They're trying to convince themselves that it's important, but it's not. Well, um, it's not. Dude important. wrestled a match, and then they said he signed a contract. Like, <laughs> I don't fucking. It's a really weird thing, man. Where you, it's almost like, especially right now in the wrestling climate, both of the extremes are too hot and too cold. Right? It's it's like we've got far left wrestling, we've got far right wrestling, and <clears throat> I just want a little bit more in the middle right now. I want us to reach across the aisle and work a little harder at telling compelling stories based I, around the quality of the in-ring work where the wins feel like they matter and there's natural inertia towards anticipation of their outcomes. It I, I sounds want, impossible. <laughs> I, I want the fucking John Moxley, Hangman Adam Page, Texas death match. I want that. It was a fine match. But what I want is it to be the third match that ends the feud. 
not the match that fucking starts the feud. Uh, I want it to also end with actual Texas deathmatch rule. Not with a fucking submission. You, you know you can't tap out in a Texas deathmatch. You just did, die? Did you know that? Well, I mean, they're all stipulations, my dude. They're just made I'm up I'm just rules. saying, you, that's not how a Texas deathmatch works. I talking never, about... It was, it was literally the first Texas deathmatch I ever saw. So I have nothing to base that off of. I, you know, well, that, that's what they're, that's how AEW is getting one over on you. That's how AEW is, is getting by is because nobody actually knows the rules. Uh, the rules don't matter. They're to be made up and it, it's not fair to the commentary team because the broadcast team has to fucking cover for this bullshit. You know, uh, it, it just, now, don't get me wrong. The original Texas Deathmatch rules are stupid as fuck anyways. Um, it's just, you know, it's frustrating when the rules aren't what you expect them to be because I saw him tapping and immediately in my head I thought, oh, this is going to be good because I thought he was still going to win the match and Hangman Adam Page was going to, you know, talk some shit about how you were giving up. But, like, that's not how the match works. Um, for those who don't know, I was about to say, please fill us in. A Texas death match is similar. It's basically a last man standing match. However, uh, you have to pin the guy first and this, I always get the order wrong. So I looked it up, but you have to pin, you have to get a three count pin first and then a 10 count is initiated. And if the person pinned fails to get up by the count of 10, the participant loses the match. Now, you may be saying, well, what's, what's the big difference? Why is it not just a 13 count last match ending? Yada, yada. Um, so there's two, there's two wrinkles to this. Is, uh, you have to prove that you're better than the guy at actual wrestling because pinning someone to, a, to the mat, raising your shoulder off the ground, isn't necessarily the same amount of effort that it takes to get up, right? And then on top of that, which again, small wrinkle, not really super relevant, but at the same time too, if you pin somebody and then you're both exhausted and neither one of you gets up, then there's still only one winner. It's the guy who scored the pinfall. So it's still not exactly the same as a regular last man standing match. And it allows for really specific but intricate you know, different types of stories you can tell where maybe the guy wins, but no one is standing, right? Maybe maybe one guy is actually just so much better at wrestling that he never gets, you know, the other guy can't get the pinfall on him, but he knocks him down for 10 seconds repeatedly throughout the match, you know, but he can never actually just pin his shoulders to the mat. You know, little stuff like that. You can go different ways with it. Um you could even go a really interesting way with the way that they booked it for Mox, where he gets stuck in the ropes and, you know, the referee says the match can't continue, but Moxley didn't want, you know, like there's so many ways you could have gone with like, oh, he slips into this, you know, like, like they could have done a no holds barred, you know, hardcore match for the first one. And Mox accidentally, in air quotes, even though he wrapped around his own fucking neck because they, they botched fighting over a chain, bro. They botched grappling over a chain. I can't. They, they botched a tug of war. Yeah, they botched something my fucking dogs can do. Um, like, there you go. I, I just don't know. I guess, no, no, no. It's hard to get it wrapped around your neck when you're that blown out from all your high speed. All the pain you're in, all the blood in your But so, they could have easily done the first match as a hardcore match, because Hangman's like, I'm going to prove I'm as tough as you. And something uh, bad, you know, something not random necessarily, but like bad luck. Mox gets caught. Catch his catch can. He, he's going to die if he doesn't tap out. You know, whatever. And then Mox has this chip on his shoulder, which they're kind of playing it up. Like he's... You know, ever since then, he's been upset. He's been acting poorly, right? He's been lashing out at Hangman's friends and stuff like that. And 
why are they even booked in a match? Like, why? Like, what What are the odds that after that match, uh, John Moxley gets booked in a match with a member of the Dark Order? Like, it's just fucking corny. Um, and so, so mm. from there, like, the story can become that Mox still thinks he's better than Hangman, and Hangman didn't actually have to suffer through this grueling, terrible, hardcore match because... John got caught. He got caught in something that will never happen to him again. It was a freak accident, right? So then you come back, and in the second match, there's no freak accidents. Mox is on his, like, best behavior, whatever. He's he's dotting his eyes, and maybe this is where he cheats. Maybe this is where we get the heel turn here. Instead of after losing the first one and just healing on motherfuckers, you know, that are his friends, maybe he actually does it in the match, which... He's not, like, afraid to cheat or do bad things, right? Like, he's one of the best tweener characters they've got. So, like, maybe maybe he sells out. Maybe Hangman's winning this wrestling match because now we don't have a stipulation. You know, now Moxley doesn't get to name the stipulation. He didn't win. So, if he wants a rematch, he's got to play by Hangman's rule, right? So, Hangman's playing it, you know, they're having a normal match and Mox cheats to win because that's just the type of guy he is. And now for the third one. Now we have the Texas death match. Now we need to know once and for all, was it a fluke? Who was really the tough guy? Who was really the badass? Because Moxley has shown that he's not going to wrestle you. He refuses to wrestle you in a stand-up normal match. And he's still got this chip on his shoulder because he hasn't proven that he can beat you in a hardcore match when there are no rules. And so... Now you have the final climactic battle where you have Texas Deathmatch rules where you have to pin the guy to prove that you're good at wrestling, but also you have to make sure that he can't answer the 10 count to prove who is the tougher son of a bitch and who can withstand the punishment. It's it's actually so fucking easy. I can't believe I just did that in three minutes. Well, there you go, folks. That's it. That is the entire resume of Sam Tate as a potential booker for his own future wrestling promotion. <laughs> and I don't know, I'm glued to the back of my seat, just thinking, man, it would be really fun to watch that executed just so that we can see if the effective storytelling is truly all that effective. But thank you so much for giving us an alternative means of booking these three matches <laughs> with Hangman page and Moxley. I think they've actually legitimately done a decent job of building what feels like bad blood between the two guys on the path that they have created anyway. However, I kind of wish Moxley had grabbed a microphone and tried to tried to weasel his way out of having to tap out that night is kind of the only thing I think has been missing from their path right now because I did feel like Blackpool Combat Club needed to um well, I guess Moxley needed to turn heel. I I think it's weird that that Wheeler and 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 uh Cesaro, Claudio also just go with the flow because Moxley's pissed off, you know, so that's a little weird. But there's a lot of things about AEW that's a little weird. And what you just presented did feel like a really strong way to to make it into a really memorable storyline, even more so than it already turned out to be and has turned out to be and will turn out to be because they're there's you're right. They're waist deep in it instead of done with it like they like a texas death match should have demanded yeah the main the only thing that like my version is really missing that might have been a goal for aew is to get the whole stable in right like but at the same time you've got you've got these guys on contract there's plenty of time to get the stable involved later anyways you know um maybe the stable gets involved between matches two and three Maybe the way that Mox cheats is one of his buddies jumps in the ring, you know, like maybe maybe Wheeler Useless comes out and and cheats for him. Something like that. Uh, Wheeler's the next Daniel Bryan. Be nice. Ah, that's we're too maybe hot a, to take. We're it's maybe a you. decade away. True. You we probably are because Wheeler's young in his career and while he's got a ton of potential. He still needs to develop a personality. So, right. Yeah. I, uh, and, and a legacy it, it, and an identity of sorts. It also doesn't help that they're clearly trying to groom him to be the next Daniel Bryan. You talk about. Um, At least he's not at the top of the card all the time. But then again, neither was Daniel Bryan. 
Right, that's true. Um, although, I mean, in AEW, he's kind of been... It's, it bothers me how many matches Daniel Bryan has lost just because he is the older wrestler and is trying to help establish young guys. There's just no reason for him to lose hour long matches, bro. It just it's it it undermines the character and now like the truth, the kayfabe of the storyline is that Daniel Bryan is just old and can't go anymore. For now, but I think that will be proven wrong. It was true against point. Hangman when he was champ. It's true against MJF while he's champ. And now he is that speed bump role. He's just the one hour speed bump guy. For now, again, I feel like there will be one more meaningful run for him near the top of a card, at the top of a card. He's he's given so much to pro wrestling and is so respected by all the boys. He'll be okay. <sighs> you know what we He'll... need, actually? There's not much time for either of these guys. Um, let's see. Who do you think is on the bubble of the way out? I feel like Finn Balor and Damian no. Priest both need to hit next levels personally. A- it, we're still in AEW. Okay. Then I feel like it's, I mean if it's not Daniel Bryan. No, it's ahead. Daniel Bryan and Kenny Omega. Okay, well, that's we, fine. We we need the hour long Kenny Omega Daniel Bryan match because neither of those guys are gonna be able to do it. Very long from now. Kenny Omega has said he doesn't really want to be the hour-long match guy. He wants to find something new. Because that was his that was his whole thing in New Japan, right? Was he was right. going to be the main event of Wrestle Kingdom. He were going to settle in for 45 minutes to an hour. You know, minimum 45 minutes. Which is kind of what old WWF pay-per-view main events used to be. But they also drained, like, at least eight minutes of those on entrances every time. And then, like, another 10 on interference. <laughs> but so, so Kenny Omega has had, has had a bunch of injuries. He's had a bunch of surgeries. And he doesn't necessarily want to be that guy anymore. But, like, I need New Japan hour-long Kenny Omega versus Jumping Jack, Super Cardio, Daniel Bryan. And it'll be the one time where I don't care who wins. It'll be the one time where I'm like, oh, Daniel Bryan, you know. The whole time I've been like, Daniel O'Brien should really just go over in this match <laughs> against basically everybody. It'll be the one time where I don't even care. I would love to see an Iron Man match that doesn't require a championship belt and is built around a powerful story of two men who want to prove which one is better than the other. Yeah, that... I, don't even, I don't even know if that one has to be Iron Man. Because like Kenny Omega wasn't really doing Iron Man matches in New Japan. He was just... Having hour long matches like Ric Flair used to. I would, hey, more. Kenny has really made me remember that I don't know everything about wrestling because I've watched enough of him over these last couple of years to realize he does a lot to um, give back to the other guy and do something unique and different, you know, in almost every contest. And, um, I'm I've really grown to appreciate him more and more. So keeping him and DB at the top of the card for as long as they're willing to be just makes sense. Um, I'd like to see an AJ Styles Kenny Omega match. Is that weird? Mm, I don't think it's weird. As in, it's not unusual. I just think that like, is that not a has that not happened before? Because I don't know if Kenny Omega and Daniel Bryan has actually happened. It's not in singles. Um, but I'd be willing to bet that AJ Styles and Kenny had at least one match. Because I guess maybe not. Maybe AJ was actually on his way out and they never did the match. Kenny just took over Bullet Club. But I I don't know. I could maybe go for that. I'm not the biggest AJ Styles fan, but Kenny really brings out the best in other people. And it would not, pro- it would, uh, you know, I'd be assuming that it's not just AJ Styles on his retirement tour WWE style. It'd be interesting to see how that universe would come together. I wonder if AJ's got much left on his contract because I could see him having a goodbye run with AEW and making that shit work. Um, yeah. You know what I find kind of peculiar about this? 
We're talking um, pseudo dream matches for AEW, but none of them seem to include the pillars. Oh, interesting. Okay, yeah, the the four pillars who, for the first time in the four year run of AEW, realize that they are set up by commentary to be on the same level playing field, but just now are like, oh, well, then maybe we should interact with each other. And they all just converge on MJF to challenge for his championship this past week on Dynamite. And everybody gets some mic time. Jack Perry gets to talk, Jungle Boy, and uh, Daniel, or Daniel Bryan, uh, Darby Allen gets to talk, which he never does. And Sammy Guevara, who we all love to hate, um, or hate to hate because I hate him. Uh, <laughs> gets to come out. And <laughs> they sure blew it with him, man. They what? They sure blew it with him. I think he blew it for himself. He's just an unlikable person. So I remember yeah, when. I remember the double or nothing. Like you remember when, when, Panda Boy. A panda boy. I don't remember. He came out. He boy. debuted with panda ears. He had like a panda helmet. Oh yeah, when he, against Kip Sabian. Yeah, he was the first that ever was... AEW match of all time. Such a weird choice. We were there for that. I but we were there for the press. We were there like, who the fuck we? are these guys? <laughs> were you there with me for that press conference that was at the pool? Right? No, where they no, I don't talk, do dorky oh, shit like too that. Too bad. I'm because... way too cool for that. That was my first time getting exposure to Sammy Guevara was him holding his title and talking shit about, you know, the product that was upcoming uh, because he was playing a heel. And God, I just remember thinking he's so annoying and, and I don't want to <laughs> listen to him. And like, and then he got very... over it and everyone loved him. And then he cheated on his girlfriend and everyone hates him. <laughs> it, like I said, if you're not a likable person, you got to be a super mega star in order to do an edge thing, you know? Oh, you dude, can't. when he was ugh, when he was going over the, I had to bust my ass, I had to work at Subway, and it's like, bro, just no one cares about you. Like, you, you blew it. No one cares. You're not going to, you're not going to win people over with sympathy, homie. Those pillars. But you, <laughs> you brought them up. What's your take? Uh... Well, so it, I don't know what are the four pillars supposed to mean exactly because I hear this term mentioned before, uh, but I'm not a stupid AEW mark. I hear it brought up because of the uh, what you call it, the promo that just happened, right? And you know, up until like I remember CM Punk mentioned it even when he was battling with MJF and I didn't for the life of me know who the pillars are supposed to be until just last week when they were all together for the big promo and people mentioned it's the four pillars together. So that's kind of my take is these are the four pillars. What does that mean? Are they just all AEW originals that people like? Is that what makes you a pillar? When AEW first got started, um, the oh, is this a common... SmackDown Five thing? I bet this it's is similar. A SmackDown Five. It, it, it's similar enough because AEW was like, you see that blue chipper right there? That guy is one of the future cornerstones, one of the pillars of our business on the up and up. You know, MJF was number one. Okay, um, so it's not just necessarily the people who like drew the most. No, it was the folks that they thought were young guns capable of carrying the business, specifically AEW's business, before too long. You know, blue chippers, for sure. Um, I mentioned MJF uh, was definitely number one, and, and honestly, in my humble opinion, got all of the really good storylines um, to help oh, no. legitimize him as an individual. His introductory stuff was really dumb to me. The whole, I'm actually Cody's friend. Psych, I'm going to turn on you. <laughs> that, shit was, that shit was bad. I felt like it took a while for him to get rolled. Well, you're, you might be right that, comparatively speaking, Darby Allen and Sammy Guevara got off to hotter starts with, you know, Sammy getting into the inner circle pretty easily. And... um. Darby Allen getting to work with Sting 
being one of the early TNT champions and just being all around super unique in that Jeff Hardy way. Getting cool matches. Right. And uh, Jungle Boy was getting the slowest burn and still on the slowest burn up the totem pole and really is only now getting to sniff what it feels like to be a single star. Um, And, you know... These four guys came together and decided that, you know, they're not the ones booking. So it was decided for them. Let's let's use this now. Let's push the tension oh. now and have the four pillars get on the microphone and, and, and go for the title at the same time. Yeah, I but, guess the pillars can't be EVPs. <laughs> right. It's true. They all have to be self-made stars through the vehicle that is AEW. And... MJF has done an incredible job. Uh, Sammy Guevara's cooled off considerably. He's also legitimately hard to like or want to watch <laughs> for his personal decisions. Um, and, and he just has me, the worst catchphrase. And he just looks wrestling. stupid, man. He looks like Steve O with six pack. And Rude. he looks like a kid I would bully. Like, come on. And I don't hate Steve O. Like, I'm not trying to make fun of Steve O. I have a lot of respect for the stuff he put his own body through, but, but he just Steve looks like O a also smarmy... looks like a kid I would bully. Right. Well, okay. <laughs> Sammy Guevara looks like a kid who was bullied who's just really loving the idea of being on top and loves rubbing it in everybody's face and blah 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 I just don't know like whereas MJF does a really good job of blending realistic like douchey tendencies with a character in wrestling Sammy's just a straight up douche and um you know I well, don't really want to watch him and finally would, would you've got... you, real quick would you ever think that MJF would try to come to the ring and Turn a sob story at any moment about how I had to work at McDonald's. Like, no, he's committed to the character. Sammy's fucking wishy washy. Um, <laughs> true, exactly. That's something you and I mentioned the other night. Is that Sammy is base is just oh, he, it's the most grating version of being a bad guy, and and MJF is the salt of the earth. He's the one who's better than you. But Sammy's like the sex god. Like, what's that got to do with being world heavyweight champion or even he, being an effective heel? You he, know, it, it's so you're good at intercourse. Who gives a fuck? Yeah, he's he's hanging out with the worst era of Jericho, and that's the problem. Like Jericho just tells mm. him, do the catchphrase. Just do it every time. If he doesn't do it, then Jericho does it for him. Where he like reminds him, like, yeah, and we're all sexy gods or whatever. And it's just shoehorned. And it's bad. It's lazy coaching uh, for lazy heel work. Don't be lazy. Yeah, agreed. Um, So anyway, nobody, like, Sammy's the bottom of the totem pole. I'm rooting for Jack Perry a little bit to continue to rise up and be a a quality contributor to the AEW singles division. Um, So it's nice to see him getting to hang out with these guys, but it did show us this past week how much he, and if I'm being quite frank, and I think you said this too, but Darby Allen, they're both just not very effective in talking at all. Right. You know, Darby at a, at, at like a, a structural level, like he just doesn't feel comfortable doing it. But, junk, you know, Jack Perry being on, a, on just a, you know, cosmetic level, like you're not doing it right yet. You're not doing it well yet. So all it did was underline the fact that MJF has taken advantage of and learned the most from all of his distinctive opportunities in the business here in AEW more effectively than virtually all of the others combined. So what program it's building to, if we're going to get a couple of singles matches, you know, to determine which one of the other pillars gets to face MJF, that's one thing. Or if they do what I would prefer and just put them all in a fatal four-way for the optimal mayhem, then MJF... Uh, a can... Fatal four-way elimination match. Sure. Well, Elimination that's fine. is always better. But Christ, no one looks even close to able to hold a candle to MJF out of those four. Um from a legitimate competitive standpoint either you might argue sammy looks the best for it but god and uh, don't do it i don't want to even like who wants to watch heel mjf versus heel sammy for 20 30 minutes right like uh... it's it's doing no favors for mjf like it's not doing anything better for his his title run so for 20 um, minutes no 
for eight minutes. Uh, I'm sure they could do something interesting. Well, we'll have to see and see where they take it. And, 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 you know, we'll have to find out if they try to tease us with, you know, helping us believe that Jack Perry and Darby Allen and Sammy Guevara are even close to that level. But I doubt that they will be treated that way. Um, it's kind of funny, too. I would wonder if we could even try to do a parallel comparison to these four pillars, like well, the pillars in, AEW, in WWE, if they had to pick the four. Um, it'd be hard. I, I don't know if you could take four stars that kind of fit into these molds so much. Um, but go ahead. You were starting to say something. Well, I have my four pillars because so I, I don't know if we talked about it at all last week um or if i just talked to you about it like off off a uh, podcast but to me the biggest thing is that promo solidified why mjf got all the pushes is the world champion and none of the rest are none of them are even in the same atmosphere on the microphone they're not even in the same universe. Fucking Jungle Boy would have to get a, a a time machine to fucking go forward in time to the future to where they have created a wormhole generator to enter the same fucking universe that MJF's promo skills are in. Like, he has no emotion. He doesn't believe anything he says. And... He's not invested in anything, so why should I be? And then you've got Darby Allen, who has no emotion, but does believe everything he says. And I think he's probably the second best. I think you said that too, where he's like the second on the pedestal, if you would. But he still is, he still has no business being near a microphone. And I've wondered, maybe it's a live thing. Maybe if like, I think he's done some edited stuff, you know, like some pre-recorded stuff that wasn't too bad where you can do like multiple takes. Uh as a as a film major in college, he should fucking understand that, you know. And then you've got Sammy Guevara, which we just ran down for 10 minutes. So like to me, that promo just showed that none of those guys are ready. None of them should get a title shot. None of them should be number 1 contender. And realistically, it just reminded me that there's a real four pillars of AEW, and I'm not sure if half those guys are in it. Well, that's true. I've thought about, like, what about Wardlow? Young big guy that they've basically built up from the ground up even more than than the, some of these guys who are named pillars who got their star at least started somewhere else. Um like Wardlow, it should be in this conversation, and Ricky Starks should be too. I mean, um, he's worked harder to come a little further, I think, than say Jack Perry has at this point. No offense, Jack Perry, it's not all your fault. I get it, but um, I also think he's in a better position than Rick, than Darby Allen. I mean, Darby Allen got kind of boring in one note, so they 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 kind of put him in the background. Um, I just. It feels like they're, they they have lots and lots and lots of potential pillars in, de- in AEW because half their roster is young and undiscovered and un you know honed talent. So I get where you're coming from. Anybody I I didn't name that you think could force their way into pillar contendership? Well, does it have to strictly be an AEW homegrown name? Because I'm gonna like for example, would a Pac count? No, I think Pac is too established into a legitimate career to be of that status. This has to be somebody who, yeah, is youthful and bright-eyed and bushy-tailed and, you know, has a a lot of mileage left on their career. Not to say Pac doesn't, it's just they don't seem, like, AEW doesn't seem ambitious to add layers to Pac at all for for some reason. Right, okay. I think he's just, like, booked in other places. I think that's a part of it. I don't know. It's weird. Um, I, I, I've i said before, I think Pac can do anything he freaking wants. 
he must not just want that much right now. He seems maybe he's just complacent. You know, a lot of guys are probably like that. They're probably decent, earning decent money to be competitive with WWE, and then just don't have to the home <laughs> schedule. Yeah, and they just God don't. Bless. Want yeah. So. Uh, okay, so I sure would Pac say has lots of great matches on Elevation and stuff. Yeah. I guess to kind of wrap this up here, because we're almost out of time, I would say my four pillars of AEW are MJF. He does make it in there. I would put in Orange Cassidy, because I don't like him, but if we're talking pillars, we're talking like put it on the map, we're talking like a SmackDown 5, shows up every week, has tons of matches, people are always happy to see him. I mean, he fits the AEW uh, crowd, you know what I mean? So Yeah, like, I, I like your pick he, of Cassidy. That's a good choice. Way over than the other three guys that were in the ring with MJF. Right. Um, I agree. So, like, he just... Maybe, and maybe it's a timing thing. Maybe in the very beginning, before Orange Cassidy was there... You know, maybe I just don't remember that Sammy Guevara and Jungle Boy and Darby Allen were having, like, regular matches all the time and popping the crowd, but this is where we're at now. Um, no. So... Darby's been gone for a hot minute, actually. Huh? I feel like Darby's been off TV for a hot minute, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, I, you know, I'm okay with that for the most part. Like, again, I don't need to see you guys all the time, so, like... Mm -hmm. And it makes it better when he does show up and Sting does a fucking splash off the top of the fucking entrance ramp and, like, they do the cool vignettes with the cars exploding. and shit. Mm -hmm. So MJF, Orange Cassidy, and then I'm going to swerve you a bit. I'm going to hit a tag team. It's the Acclaimed. The Acclaimed nice. have arrived, and they arrived in AEW, and they've gotten over so organically, you know, and just been so consistent. And, like, the... The acclaimed, you know, with the whole rapping Max Caster thing and the extra catchphrases and the behind the scenes stuff, like it's translated well. I don't have to watch YouTube videos to understand the the guns and the acclaims relationship, although it does help if you watched like a Dan Housen vlog or two, but right, okay. you know, like I didn't have to do that shit. So I'm a big fan of the acclaimed. I think they make it in there if you're allowed to put a tag team as one spot, which spoiler you can in wrestling. Yeah, I like it. I think that's a clever choice. I think the acclaimed are one of the uh, criminally underappreciated teams because they got you know a well deserved tag team title win and then quickly had to give it up to you know a team and that I yeah is definitely like in bed with somebody who works closely with the EVPs like Billy Gunn. He's Billy yeah. Gunn is the, the Tully Blanchard to well, FTR. Like help my boys well, get over, you know, a lot of their tag teams got wrapped up into trio stuff too. So um, <laughs> they had True. to get the Lucha bros to help put over trios matches and, and the young bucks are doing trio stuff, but the young bucks wanted to make tag team wrestling a priority. So if we're going to make it a priority, put a tag team in your pillar. And then for the fourth pillar spot, I'm going to swerve you again. And this might be a double, triple, quadruple swerve because I'm going to go with the female wrestler. And if you remember CM Punk's line to MJF that he got replaced by Britt Baker. Right. Which was nice. You know, I like that idea. Of course, I didn't replace MJF. He's still one of the four pillars. But that was kind of based on the time, right? That was... A, a time capsule of Britt Baker's really historic run. And Britt might get this spot, but I'm giving it to Hikaru Shida. Oh, wow. You swerved me for swerving's sake. Wow. Yeah, because Hikaru, Hikaru Shida... We haven't seen her in AEW in at least seven months. Right, but she was champion for over a year. And she's what put the women's championship really on the map for me. Um, I didn't think Nyla Rose had a great run. I wasn't <clears throat> wasn't a big Nyla Rose fan. wasn't the biggest Riho fan, and I really felt like the women's matches were not picking up. They didn't have a good Styles clash. But then Hikaru Shida just had a good match with everybody. She just had good match after good match after good match. She had excellent presentation. She had everything you want. Um, I really don't think that their women's division picked up until she was champ, and. I was watching for Hikaru Shida. I was watching for the women's 
championship matches, you know, for their women's division. And I think Jade Cardgill could have taken this spot if she had, like, really impressive matches or storylines, but, you know, it is what it is. You've built a really compelling little little group there. I appreciate it. And, you know, outside of Wardlow and Ricky Starks, I'm struggling to think who I would add that you didn't, that just you did. You have excellent reasoning behind it. So maybe I'll just take a deep breath and say you can leave it there um, because I, I, I feel like there's a ton of young talent in AEW. Um, I, I, I feel like they're still figuring out how they want to run the company as far as storytelling is concerned. And it's been a lot of stop, go motion a little bit. Like sometimes there's been some really sincerely awesome stuff produced. And sometimes it, it struggles to really uh, help me understand why the decisions are being made the way they are, but that's wrestling in a nutshell. It's a great microcosm of the whole industry. So um, yeah, outside of Ricky Wardlow, MJF, and I really liked where you're going with Britt Baker because I think she is a pillar of the of the company, if not Jamie Hayter, you know, for how well <laughs> she's organically developed. She, she's new. She's she's a little new on the scene, right? Like that's the other thing. This is gonna change and evolve over time. So if you're talking about guys who got the company established early on, you know, I get why they picked who they picked, but I'm picking the four people that are the reason I watch AEW. I love it. I think that's cool. I hope that you guys tune in and watch a little bit more of Sam's picks and keep trying to stoke the fires of momentum to the underdogs because we don't want WWE getting too complacent and they have uh they're walking into WrestleMania a little complacent right now, devoid of storylines, devoid of not storylines, surprises, um devoid of um this feeling like anything can happen right now. So keep your eye out for Demon Finn Balor to add an interesting wrinkle. Let's see if Bray Wyatt can redeem anything about what's happening with their storyline, but I highly doubt it at this point. Even I'm over him, and that's just tragic. Um, And let's see if Cody can take any of these last couple of moments and make us a believer. But um, wrestling's in a weird flux right now. We'll have to see what happens. Yeah, and let me know who your four pillars are of either company, really, any company. Uh, let me know who I left out. Who are your who are your top picks, basically? Uh, but that's going to do it for this podcast. That's another scheduled for one fall in the can with the one, two, three. I've been Sam Tate, Ace Maneuvers. My buddy Roz Warren has joined me, and we'll see you guys next Wednesday with another episode. Peace out.